So gray mail filtering, uh, we can leverage sender base, which provides us reputation data on who's actually sending us an email. If somebody is a spammer, if they are an attacker, how do we know? Because remember, sender base has got insight to a huge portion of the world's email. There's so many customers using this that when some scumbag attacker attacks a customer, if it's detected, and it should be, we're getting better signatures every day, when we detect that, we punt the results back to a central database. And again, it's not like this is the first time we've seen an attack and we, and we react to it, but we don't forget it. We go, all right, there's that guy again causing those problems. It's not helping his reputation. And as we do this over time, we just adjust that reputation score. The reputation scores are dynamic. They're living values that are going up and down. So things can heal, they can get better, they can get worse. The reputation scores are essential, as it says here, for the anti-spam protection. Again, they call it sender base. This is one of the, the secret ingredients. You know, if, if, I don't know, if you're excited about waffle fries and you think this restaurant makes, you know, I like them because of waffle fries, you might like Cisco's email protection specifically because of sender base. Maybe you don't like the way policies are built. Maybe you wish there were more knobs. Maybe you wish there were fewer. Just realize that this reputation score is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for all the other components that we talked about. And it didn't just happen like in that instant that the email arrived. This is from years and years of paying attention to who's causing problems and who's behaving like they should. That gives us a very, I think, um, high integrity kind of weighted value that's being returned to us. We can't make good decisions without good data. And this really is. I think center base is, is very powerful. Um, not that you're here for my opinions, but just <laughs> realize that this is handling a, a lot of that incoming traffic. Because we can make those early decisions um, regarding whether something is good or bad, it's going to allow us to process a higher volume of traffic without a ton of resources. Um, finding the SBRS of a sender is the first step. So email comes in, what do we do? Well, if the recipient's accepted, that's okay, we'll keep processing it. Uh, now, there's a good chance that a message comes in and we go, wait a minute, there's too many recipients this hour. What? Like, I'm a customer of yours. Wouldn't you want more orders from me? Maybe not. Maybe your reputation is so bad that we want to limit how much traffic that we get from you. So you can do queries. You can see where you're at on different companies' blacklists or if you're present. Uh, and of course, you've got 554 access denied. So these are just some of the fun codes uh, that you may see if you were to look at this. You can do a lot of this by hand, just using a terminal client like Telnet or Putty and using a Telnet connection into a, a remote mail server. Telnet to that server on port 25, and then we can actually issue SMTP commands. Remember that SMTP is a standard. So the actual commands that you use in SMTP are all defined in the RFC. Anybody can use them. So because this is standardized, because the, the commands are standardized, you can type to an SMTP server just like you're a client, which is kind of neat if you want to test this stuff out. So again, uh, you had a sending MTA. It sent a hello to the ESA. Uh, the ESA queried in the back end, and it's like, hey, I've got this message that's you know, for 1.2.3.4. Um, we get information about the score of 1.2.3.4, and then based on that score, we're going to have rule hits. We say, OK, well, the reputation score is x. Here's what we're going to do. Right, accept, delay, uh, reject, etc. So here is taking a look at that sender-based reputation scoring system. Remember that it's from negative 10 being the worst to positive 10, which is the best. And we go, what is positive 10? I said, this is absolutely trustworthy email. It is not a scam. It is no chance of it doing anything hostile. Even just saying that, I was like, are you sure? So positive 10 is hard to hit. Negative 10, we go, OK, it's absolutely the worst thing in the universe. We go, each and every time? So we've got to be a bit you know, <laughs> more subjective than that. So what we wind up with are these ranges. We go, if you fall into this range, we think you're definitely a sport source of spam. If you're in, over here, you're probably a sport source of spam. Here, eh, you're neutral. It's not bad. It's not great. Uh, here we've got most likely trustworthy versus definitely trustworthy. 
Now, what we'll typically do is associate these scores with terms like blacklist, suspect list, unknown list, and of course, alter our filtering or our security uh, posture based on that reputation. So if we know that you send a lot of spam, that you're always causing problems, and we're gonna be kind of hesitant about how much traffic we accept from you and what we allow you to do. So again, here you see the sender base ranges. Realize that blacklist, suspect list, unknown list, these are all things that you can modify. Cisco built these rules for you, but you can change them. As you monitor this, as you use it within your organization, we think these numbers should be appropriate. If you find out that they're not, maybe you're dealing with certain partners or um, you are one of the partners that is, is causing these issues between servers, of course we can create exception lists as well as editing the sender base reputation score at a global level. If you do it across the box, it's gonna impact everything. I'd like to try to do that for individual um, domains and individual circumstances if possible. The anti-spam process is really what this is all about. You know, we wanna have less spam in our inbox. So as traffic comes in, we leverage Talos intelligence. Again, good, bad, or unknown. For the unknown, this is where we're gonna apply our intelligent analysis engines. Um, when we talk about the intelligent uh, engines that are running under the hood, here we see the term Cisco Ironport Anti-Spam. This was really the, um, the technology, this and that sender base that made Ironport so famous. There was a, a dark period of time <laughs> where we once had to compete with um, Ironport. You know, before the acquisition, we were using a product called um, Content Services and Control. There was a CSC module for the firewall that did all of our, our email filtering. And it wasn't a bad device. You know, we went from not having visibility to having visibility and having controls. But when you'd go into the field and you'd pitch like the Trend Micro solution against the, and it was just a partner, um, but we pitched that against Ironport and it was not pretty. Um, fortunately, after losing many bids, uh, Cisco went ahead and bought Ironport. And they've been brought in, it became the ESA, and it's been just a fantastic relationship ever since. You see here you've got email reputation, message content, the message structure, web reputation. We've gone through most of these already, but we've enhanced Ironport because we've got the ability to tie into additional uh, engines. So you can use Cisco's intelligent multi-scan, so it's scanned by a third-party anti-spam engine, just additional signatures. Cisco's anti-spam assumes the responsibility for that final verdict and its combined benefits of third-party scanning engines with a low false positive rate. So again, just an additional capability that we can leverage. We'll talk about some of those third-party uh, components that we can leverage inside of the ESA as well. So whenever we see spam, you know, we, we say, what do we see? And we go, well, it's definitely spam or it's probably spam. And then we talk about, well, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Again, it's just ifs and ands. So if it's positively identified, we'll drop. If it's suspected, we can deliver it, but we can put suspected spam and we can inject that word just like that in the subject. So every time the, the recipient gets a message that we think is spam, it'll have that label bolted into it. What's cool about this is and there's a good chance their mail client is sorting spam as well, but they can easily create rules to do some type of action in their inbox based on our adding of this keyword or tag to the subject line. So again, just taking a look at the mail flow, right? We enable spam detection and we take a look at traffic coming in, right? The first thing that we do is match our hat policy and then we go, oh, should we skip anti, uh, the anti-spam based on the hat? If it's known good, if it's coming from our partner, maybe we do. In this case, um, you know, they say yes, but flag, uh, continue in pipeline, but flag to skip anti-spam. This gets passed through that pipeline, and then we go, okay, should we pass anti-spam? Yes, but continue in the pipeline. Skips it. Comes over here, is anti-spam enabled? Yes, apply anti-spam settings uh, to this match policy. Alternatively, if anti-spam is not enabled, we just pass it through. This is an example of anti-spam, but it could be any of, the, any of the intermediate filters that we talked about. Should this particular flow go through those inspection engines? And again, we're in control of the if and then solution. So if 
what traffic gets sanitized. And when we talk about anti-spam, we talk about antivirus, sanitized in what way, to what thresholds? So different spam detection settings can be configured on different mail policies. The anti-spam feature is usually used for incoming email. Why? Because we're not spamming going out. Optionally, spam protection can be enabled for outgoing email. Maybe somebody did something silly. I see that happening all the time where somebody's trying to aggress a group of 100 users, use the wrong group, and now you just hit a group of 10,000 users. Oops, unsend, right? So we could set certain metrics for extremes, and we could look at outgoing mail and go, you know, if anybody's doing this, maybe we want to stop it. Um, again, just depends on your environment. Different anti-spam filtering tools can be enabled on a per-policy basis, and then after the spam scanning, headers can be added to the message based on what we've discovered. Remember that gray mail is, we say that it's unwanted, you're like, it's spam, but it's not technically spam. It's like, why not? It's like, well, it's unwanted, but you said that you wanted it. This is just the crap notifications and alerts that come from newsletters, marketing materials, social networking sites, bulk email, and more. We go, this isn't a person-to-person -person email. This is a big you know, marketing blast, but it's one that you opted in for. So because their unsubscribed data at the bottom looks legitimate, because they're following the rules, we're going to let this through. But Again, maybe it's a, a company of 50,000 users. When you add up the cost of 50,000 users with huge volumes of gray mail being leaked through, what is the cost of the business? And when you start to look at it that way, I tend to lean towards uh, you know, classifying or filtering this gray mail in, in such a way that we just you know, maybe route it to a special folder, flag it a certain way, um, or just drop it. So gray mail engine classifies each gray mail in one of the following three categories marketing email, social networking, and bulk. So we've even got subcategories of grayware. Again, the idea is this allows us to go, okay, well, for this subcategory, I'm gonna take a slightly separate action. What is the use case? Well, you can imagine. Anytime we've got traffic coming into different groups of users, well, do we want those users getting gray mail? We can determine that at the corporate level. We say for the entire business, Gray mail is allowed. And then we can look for different departments and go, you know what? We've got a customer service team that's not re responsible for a ton of acquisitions. Maybe we think it's foolish to send thousands of emails to hundreds of customer service people every single day that are marketing for other people's services. I mean, after all, this is our corporate email and they're not actually doing any type of acquisition. Each scenario is gonna be different in what you wanna permit or deny. Uh, this slide is just reinforcing the fact that we can create groups of users and then have appropriate policies censoring or, or filtering the email that goes into each of those groups of users. Here's what it would look like from within the ESA. Uh, as I mentioned before, your default policy is at the bottom. We, def we define things here that we think are appropriate company-wide. Why is that? Because when you add new policies, IT, sales, HR, these are gonna to apply to different people. When they do, this is where we see what we're gonna do. What do we do for anti-spam? You've got different options selected that are appropriate for different groups of users. For antivirus, if I don't do anything special, just inherit the default, which down here says it's disabled. You'll inherit defaults by default, but realize the whole uh, purpose of creating these other policies is to take different actions on different groups of users.